what advice could you give her like right now in terms of hey you can take the risk and don't have that parental guilt that if zandy spoke to 70 80 90 year old people not named me and not someone who is her grand father or mother mm. a non relative yeah that if she spent a lot of, if she's had five conversations with anyone who's 80 years old mm. and asked them about life the number one thing she would extract is you don't want to live life for regret absolutely the thing i would say to zandy is if you quit now working at miller or nike mm. in johannesburg or Cape Town, wherever you are, mm. and it doesn't work out. This dream that you have yeah. that's making you want to jump. Mm. Well, good news. You can always go and work for Procter & Gamble or Unilever Absolutely. or Kraft. Yeah. The, the thing that people that tend to be stuck in a corporate environment don't understand is they've, that the world has done a very effective job mm. to tell you that you having a gap in your resume is bad at a time when having a gap in your resume is good. Yes, exactly. Cuz resumes are supposed to oh we say CVs back home, CVs, right? right? CVs need to look a certain That's way. Right. I was saying to him like I started out as a DJ yes. and then I was like I cannot be a 40-year-old DJ and I took that and made it into a CV. I still to this day even for my latest job they were like what's that gap? But I made it a positive story. Well, that's right. And more importantly, like the world's changing. Mm, like mm. This company, I've never, we've never required a college degree. We don't, mm. I don't, I have no clue where these two gentlemen went to college. Did you go to college, Justin? They're like, Oops. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like it doesn't even cross doesn't. my mind. It's a non-factor. And so the world's moving, and so if you, if you play your life by yesterday's rules, you're in trouble. Absolutely. You're better off playing your life on today's rules with an eye towards tomorrow's Got rules. It. And so what I would tell Zandi and anybody else mm. is either you won't do it and you'll regret it your whole life. Exactly. Or you will do it. It'll either go phenomenal and be the great gift, yeah. or you'll lose. And at least you tried, yeah. and now you can go back to a job. And you know the fun thing is when you go back. Because I did a stint in entrepreneurship. It actually just makes you smarter to handle your PNL, right? Because you're like, I handle the risk on my own. Yeah, a lot of yeah. people are being humbled in the last ten years of not being capable of being entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. and that's okay. I was with yeah. a creator today at an event who has amassed millions and millions of followers through ice cream and mm -hmm. viral ice cream. He thought. Like, oh, let me go build an ice cream store too. He realized he couldn't. Mm. And so now he's back to doing full time. And that's great. That's great. That's you not a loss. The that's not a scarlet letter. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, it's going to make people realize that entrepreneurs who could pull it off, mm. it's a very small, rare talent. Absolutely. And, and I don't think I'm special for that. That's like an athlete or a yeah. singer or an art. Like, everyone has different skills. And so I would say that if it's burning inside of you and you want to try, you must. Because regret is the ultimate poison in life. I want to remind people, you're in control. Yeah. It's incredibly important and appropriate, and I appreciate, especially being very cordial for people to ask and things of that nature, but I want to remind people they're in control. Yeah. I want to provide value and put out things in my professional career. I'm incredibly private and feel that the world is entitled to what you give it. So when I watch people get upset when people get into their business, I'm like, you're giving them your business. By the way, you're leveraging your business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't want to leverage yeah. nor give my personal life to the world. I don't think that's the right way. Yeah. yeah. By the way, yeah. I just think it's my way. Yeah. Um, so the reason I have a little bit to what you're referring to is it became not sustainable because it's been a long time and like yeah. I was in a transit like it just it was the appropriate time yeah and I needed to just get some context out there but I'm uh it's not where I'm gonna go yeah and that's what I was more interested by yeah. to me it's not listen us being together my brain goes into maximize the value at the highest levels because we have the opportunity yeah. to for as many people are listening the takeaway there from my perspective is you're in control. Yeah. You have a learning disability and you want to share it? Mazel tov. You don't? Great. Yeah. It took me back to something less serious. It took me 15 years of public life to say I'm not candorous. And it's hurt me in my personal life and it's hurt me in my business life. You get to share what you want to share. Yeah. And and I think people should be careful of what they share. Yes. You share your abs as a like as a, like you're a good shaped dude people are going to talk about your body for the rest of your life yeah yeah but you did that yeah. you're going to show your kid all the time they're going to talk about that relationship they're going to talk you're giving the world permission yeah i prefer not to give the world permission because that's a sacred place for me yeah 
you know, even uh, look at my mom. She like the greatest gift I could give to the world is my mom to the world. The greatest. She's alpha me. She's more experienced. She's a different perspective as a mom. As a she doesn't want it. The end. Right. I thought my dad and mom would be reverse. My dad, I never <laughs> thought would love the limelight so much. Um, but you know, so I think if you're listening right now, please. If you're not going on social media because you have a skeleton in your closet, you have a disease, you have a bad you know, situation, you, uh, you're like me and like grew up in a family where like personal life is private. That's, I think, you know, in Russia, that was like, people would go to jail if anybody knew anything about you. So I think it ingrained in my parents, which then ingrained in me and my sister and brother. Like, we're private that way. Um, you know, I think you have to understand you're in control. Facebook and TikTok and podcasts and YouTube don't make you do anything. Yeah. They don't make you do anything. I'm so glad you addressed that because I think there's, and this is why I brought it up, I think there's been a mask of false vulnerability that's been encouraged because of social media. So people think that the more vulnerable or more open you sure. are, that shows authenticity. Yeah, I totally so disagree. Vulnerability. I, I love you for that. Right? You're going yeah. to a very smart place. Yeah. I would argue, I see more lack of authenticity in the way that people are leveraging their family and personal life yeah. because they know it does well. I think the lack of accountability is leading to so much unhappiness. Mm -hmm. Like life is so much better when you're like, this was my fault. Yeah, absolutely. You're in control. Yeah. And so like, you know, this was like a wrap up to control. You're in control, yeah. you, yeah. you. You decide what you consume. You decide what you believe. You decide who you surround yourself with. You decide what you put out. Take on accountability. Yeah. Everybody wants the blame right now. Yeah, the yeah. algorithm. They're acting as the algorithms are like hypnosis. Mm -hmm. And I understand endorphin hits and all that, but like you can delete the app. Mm -hmm. You can. Like where's accountability in this? Yeah. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Like, no, we have I... alcohol, we have tobacco, we have drugs, we have weapons, and we have all sorts of issues, but most people play within moderation. That's on you. Yeah. And it's a tough truth, right? It's a it's a tough It's a tough truth. It's a tough truth. Especially yeah. when you're unhappy. Yeah, yeah. That goes back to why it's important. It's like the chicken and egg. It's like working out. Like I got into better shape the last eight years. Nothing comes less natural to me. <laughs> yeah, tell me Nothing that. comes uh, less relate, natural to me. I can me, relate to you. Right? Yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah. But like, I was like, I just would like to live longer. Yes. I would just like to live longer. They're sitting there and they're like, oh, I just feel like I'm not include with culture. But here's you. Every single week you're putting yourself out there. Any words of adv advice for the brand managers that just feel I can't keep up with culture and the insights? That there's no choice. Mm, mm. You know, when I hear people say, well, I can't keep up with another platform as yeah. a creator. Like, Gary, I don't want to post on mm. these. Like, all you're doing is you're limiting your upside. Absolutely. And I think, look, I think the reason most brand marketing is very bad mm -hmm. is because I do think that most brand managers and CMOs live in ivory towers and boardrooms mm -hmm. and have no idea what's actually happening to their consumer and are more worried about their customer, meaning the retailer that sells their stuff, mm -hmm. than the customer that buys it from that retailer. Exactly, Joe's Tavern and not, you know, Chava that's buying the Casa Light. That's right, and so for me, the reason <laughs> I'm always able to win historically yeah. or why I get a hard time from the establishment mm -hmm. is because I don't think about anything but the consumer. Yeah. I don't know how to. Mm -hmm. How could you possibly do that? Yeah. Why would you do that? Exactly. That's the ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. Like you say, what's a good marketer? You know, like you reverse engineer backwards. Yeah. The goal is for someone to buy your stuff. If you don't understand what's interesting to them, the biggest issue with professors in marketing mm -hmm. is they speak in theory versus reality. Absolutely. Of course, reach and not market context as well, because Mina is different to the rest of, of Africa. Of course. Mm. All I think that matters is relevance. Yeah. It's why the point you just made, forget about me, you know, forget about Europe versus Africa versus America. I'm talking about Manhattan. This is a small island. Yeah. Do you understand how different the people that live up there, that's the Upper East Side, are than the people who live down there? Oh, can I see Tribeca? The this, is like a this is not just America. This is <laughs> yes. not even New York State. Yeah. This is not even New York City. Yeah. This is little Manhattan. Yeah. And literally, 20 minute walk this way mm. and 25 minute walk that way. Mm. It's like bizarro different parts of the world. In, we're staying in uh, Times Square and we're just like, what is Yeah, Times Square's not even what New York. This? It's like a melting pot of tourism. <laughs> exactly. And so, yeah, yeah. and so, yeah, I think yeah. marketers are looking for simplicity. Got Don't it. forget, a brand manager has mm. a lot of responsibilities besides marketing. Yo, I know. <laughs> they, have, they have supply chain. Yeah. 
They price ha- increase. They have, which is real. Mm. They have retail relationship, Absolutely. distribution. They have to get along with the sales team. Mm. Like, I have a lot of empathy for everyone we're talking to on the call. That empathy doesn't allow me to look the other way Got it. when the last thing they are is consumer centric. Absolutely. No, it's well said. And the thing I want to add in is the unconscious bias as well. Because so many times you'll have brand managers that they oh, I don't listen to I'm a piano. Now every brand manager wants to book the biggest I'm a piano DJ because it's cool now, you know? That's right. Like that stuff I have never understood. Gar- yeah. I, I'll never forget early in my career, I had a 65 year old white male mm. who was selling product to teenage diverse Americans Mm. say to me, but Gary, I don't get YouTube. And I said, good news. We're not trying to sell this candy to you. Yeah. I define success as waking up and being happy and being able to do what you want to do at all times. Yeah, and as a parent, would you rather have your kids be successful or happy? That's an easy one, right? It's super simple and like, and we, we, we are absolutely at an inflection point where there's people like me and different things happening where we're starting to have different conversations. Like nothing, freedom is what everybody's chasing, but they're confused about what it actually looks like. It's not how much you make, it's how much you spend. There's a lot of people who could be way more free if they didn't overextend themselves on what they're buying. What's Keeping most... up with the Joneses, yeah, uh... it is the poison of our society. <laughs> it is. So, so that's your definition of success. What's, what's the role of failure and why, again, putting myself Micro in... Micro failure in the process Sorry? of... Are you asking me the, the role of failure in getting to success? As part of it? If it's, you know, you can, is it related? Is it a necessary part? You know, there, I put myself in a group of people who like, you know... You don't want to fail when you're younger. It's going to be embarrassing. You know, you've had all these successes. You've done well in school. You've done wrong. And to have a failure. And now, you know, I think that's the one thing at this point in my life. It's like, did I take enough risk? Did I put myself out there enough? You definitely didn't. What's that? You definitely did not. Yeah. (laughs) And here's how I know it. At at least, again, one man's point of view. I'm not sure anybody is taking enough risk from 20 to 30. It is the most interesting thing that I've been thinking about, which is it is never more practical to be disproportionately risky than from 22 to 30, yet everybody goes the other way because now they're the real world and it's time to prove something to their parents, to themselves, to everybody else, and everybody goes conservative. It is a huge mistake. We need to flip it upside down. Everybody should go ham from 22 to 30 and do a ton of ridiculous shit and figure themselves out. But, mm-hmm. but, on your own dime, not your parents. <laughs> There's the parents clapping. So, so, how I think about it is, you should go and be rogue and get to know yourself and taste shit from 22 to 30, but you have to live by the ramifications of doing that. And the cost of entry of that is living with four people in a studio apartment eating dog shit food and not having fancy shit. When you go and do that, but you're being subsidized by your parents, then you're living in a fake environment and you're super fucked. <laughs> Tell us about failure and why it's important to I fail. I love it. Yeah, because you, you, you mentioned I love, you it. love it. I love it. I like micro failure. I like micro failure. I hate macro failure. Like, death of your business is bad. But, but, to me, you know what's funny? I'll use a boxing analogy. My favorite boxing, I watch a lot of boxing. I think boxing's a very interesting, and, I know, and I'm super into mixed martial arts, but I grew up on boxing, I understand it better. And I like watching it, because there's so many things that happen in boxing. First of all, what I love about boxing is there's nowhere to hide. You know, like it's super interesting, right? There's nowhere to hide. Number two, there's, some, there's a scenario in boxing that I love the most. There's, for some reason, there's nothing more interesting to me than watching somebody get knocked down in the first round and then go on to win the fight easily. It's an interesting psyche, right? And I like that, and this is what I'm thinking about it, which is like, here's what's bad in boxing and in business. Going into a fight, getting knocked the fuck out in the first round and losing the match, bad. Getting knocked down 
and then having the adversity to readjust to what you got caught on and navigating it to easily win a fight is remarkable. That's how I think about entrepreneurship. People, the reason so many people struggle with entrepreneurship is you have micro failures almost daily and they're very in your face. You can't hide. And uh, I like that. Uh, I like failure I, I, because I think I deserve it. I hate when people don't respect the game. When I fail, it means I fucked up. And I like that because I think people get audacious. My number one thing that I hate about capitalism is that people use it and they love it and they're big capitalists and they love open market and competition and all that and then they become 73 and they try to use all their money to protect their money. They're not willing to let a young lion eat them the way they ate somebody else. I hate when they try to manipulate it. That's what I love about sports. What I love about sports is when you're 36 and you were once the best player in the league, but now you're getting a little bit older and your body breaks down, you are forced to retire. The one thing that entrepreneurship and capitalism has to adjust to is once you get old and you're tired and you wanna be on a yacht instead of working your shit, you should lose some money because you're losing. And, and that part, you know, we bring up so many great entrepreneurs and you're one of them to, you, know, you hear all the successes and I think it gets romanticized a lot, just how ridiculously difficult, stressful, sleepless nights and, and I do think you have to experience failure because you, you learn just the way the human being is wired, you're gonna learn 10x ooh, ooh, ooh. With, with some failure than you are with let some me, adversity. I'm actually getting excited here. Or let me, let, me, let me frame it up a little bit different. Or you love it so much, so much, that you never were able to do anything else and just the process of playing the game is the success itself. Or you love it so much that you actually don't give a fuck about the trophies, aka the money that comes along with it, it's that you just wouldn't know how to breathe otherwise if you weren't in the process of entrepreneurship itself. I will never fail because there is no failure. The at bat is the macro win. If I lost all my money because I did 37 ridiculously bad decisions and over leveraged myself, the ability to go back to zero and try to like buy shit at the dollar store and flip it on eBay and build it back up weirdly excites me more than where I am right now. I swear on my children's health. No kidding. The thought of going to zero, having all of you judge me as, see, he wasn't as good as you thought, and then rising back like a phoenix and sticking it in your fucking face <laughs> excites the shit out of me. I believe that right there is the definition of entrepreneurship. It's when you love your game more than what the game gives you. That's why I like losing. The game told me I lost. Respect to the game. That's why I like playing. I did this when, my friends, I was an entrepreneur when there was no conversation around this. In the 80s and 90s school system and society that I grew up in, I was a failure for making $2,000 a weekend selling baseball cards. Like, I did this when it wasn't cool. I'll do it now while it's cool, and I'll do it again in 15 years when it's not cool again because the economy will collapse and because we don't like to be accountable, we like blaming things, and so we're gonna blame entrepreneurship not the fact that you weren't self-aware and didn't realize that you weren't a fucking entrepreneur. Uh, is right. <laughs> it's, uh, it's funny, last year Kobe sat right here and it's almost the exact same thing he said about practice. Like he loves practice. He loves beating people up in practice, embarrassing people in practice. It's so much about the process, not the result. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Like. I, when people ask me what's your failures, I've got none. I found my place. I will do it in perpetuity and the gratitude that oozes out of my soul is why I put out so much content the way I do because I'm desperate to give back on something that I realize I was gifted by circumstance and I feel a level of gratitude and almost a level of guilt and a need to communicate in a framework that so many people in this room did not have the luxury of that North Star or the ability to stumble into their perfect place. The number one way to get happier is to take on 100% full accountability. 
if you literally wake up, this is very nuanced, so I'm gonna say it nice and slow. If you wake up and say, everything is my fault, when people hear that, they think that will make you more unhappy. I'm a piece of shit, I'm a loser, it's not true. It is if you don't understand it, which is why I'm breaking it down slow. If you say everything is my fault, you get optimistic in knowing that you can then fix it. It's a big deal. The reason I believe that I'm happy is because I think everything's my fault. And so what happens is if you're blaming your parents, which so many do, you're in big trouble. Because guess what, they had parents too. So blame your grandparents. You know, VCon, I said, fuck your grandparents. And the whole crowd was like, what the fuck just happened? And I was like, no, no, but let me explain what I'm actually trying to say, right? Which is, you can't be mad at your dad knowing that your grandma fucked him up. And oh, by the way, there's great grandparents. So I think it, what I want for everyone is to be fully accountable. It's like the amount of people that blame the president, what a joke, their parents. I get it, but it's not going to be productive. The second you realize, like sure, you could have a lot of anxiety and resentment towards your mother, but you're now grown. And maybe instead of buying a new Xbox, you can go do therapy, meditation, exercise. And by the way, you don't need to pay for things. Why don't you go outside and take a two hour walk, put on some headphones, because I know you have those, mm -hmm. and listen to a podcast that's free. This right here, listen to it every day. I'm not joking. I'm trying to get you some views. Appreciate listen it. to this every day. Like it will like, and so get positivity in your ears become fully accountable to your life. It's not the government or your parents' fault. It's they've put you in certain situations, but you have the strength and capacity to make it better. You just do. And once that happens, it becomes such a good life. You're mad at your husband? Talk to him. Instead of being resentful and acting out, Go and have a couple's therapy session, or if you can't afford it, because I always hedge against that. Because yep. again, the comments will be like, oh, you have therapy, but 200 bucks, okay. How about just being kind and candorous to your spouse? Sit them down and be like, I don't like when you do this. I don't like that you're doing that. I don't appreciate that after you're done with work, you go hang out with your buddies. Like, talk, because then he or she may say, well, I don't like that, and you know, communication. Yeah. Get the poison out of your body. That's another thing I would want. Get the poison out of your body. That poison, those feelings, you've got to say them. Now, if you wait until you're on full tilt and you're like, mom, you're a fucking piece of shit. You fucked me up. That's not gonna be productive. Right. Mom's not gonna be like, oh, thank you. <laughs> no, no, you gotta get into the right place to have these talks and they're not gonna be receptive. I haven't been, uh, like in my life when people have come to me, like it's not a natural, like it's hard. Yeah. And I'm very accountable. And even for me, it's like, mm. I don't like that. Yeah, you get defensive. <laughs> like, you know, I don't like that. <laughs> but but I've gotten really good at being like, mm, like, and I like it. And like, now I really appreciate the feedback. And like, we just all have to go there. Accountability and kind, candor communication on some of the shit that's inside of you. And understanding the following sentence. And if you do none of that, I don't give a fuck. Like, I'm not your fucking dad. You're not my brother. You know what I mean? Like, like I get so mad when people get mad at people that are trying to help them. Mm -hmm. Fuck you, okay? Knock yourself out. Sit in your fucking room and be angry for the rest of your life. What the fuck do you want? Mm -hmm. Stand on your own two emotional feet. I want it for you. I will be out here doing shit like this forever. Like many, by the way, I'm not special. There are many, many, many of thousands of people out there navigating, trying to put good shit out there. Right? Yep. And uh, you know, you gotta find the person that does it for you, but like, man, complaining is fucking loser shit. It's dangerous, it's self-deprecating. It well, self-deprecating could be cute. It's self, in it's- jest. It's, yes, in jest, to your point. But that's, you know, like, comp but you know, at least self-deprecation, even in jest or in reality, there's a level of accountability. That's like not loving yourself enough. Yeah. Complaining is my boss, will never let me succeed. Are you out of your fucking mind? Your boss at a random company? There's 87 trillion companies. Yeah. Quit. Oh, easy for you to say, Gary, I have a mortgage, I have this. No, no, okay. So tonight, instead of doing whatever the fuck you're doing for four hours, that isn't what I'm about to tell you, go on LinkedIn and email 100 people. Update your LinkedIn account. Post content about your expertise 
in financial services or in real estate or in bagel making and let somebody find you. You can do shit. Yep. You can do shit. And I'm not sitting here trying to motivate you. This is like, I, I actually get weird when people are like, you're motivational. I'm like, I'm practical. <laughs> I'm not motivational. I'm, pr- I'm obsessed with practicality. Yeah. Like, if you hate your job, you can either drink alcohol to escape it, you can find another loser friend and complain with them and be like, I'm, I'm, I'm rude. or you can go home and pound LinkedIn until your next job comes that pays you more so you can leave. Or to your point, you can take a self-awareness moment and say, what am I doing at my job that is keeping me from growing? You're going fucking 301. I'm just trying to show them how easy it is to get away. Kudos to you, you took it up a notch. Yeah, or you could be like, why does this? Well, maybe because I'm a gossip in the office and causing trouble, no wonder fucking boss is mad at me. Maybe because, how about this one? Maybe because I know that I'm working remote for three days a week and I'm really only working four hours. (laughs) Oh, that's on You fucking full of shit fuckers. How about that one? (laughs) Fuck my job. I'm like, you don't work. The fuck do you want them to do? Most most bosses and leaders, they want their best talent. If you're the best, they're going to move you to the top. And by the way, let's go the other side. I know a lot of bosses hold down talent that's better than them because they don't want them to jump them. I know that. Yeah. I'm thinking about it as a... I know. As a... I know. I know. It. Notice how, where I just jumped in. Sorry, you're right. No, you're 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 like me. The only thing the... you care about is the logo. Yeah. I'm agnostic. I don't care if you're my brother-in-law, my best friend, or somebody I met yesterday. Whoever can be the best player on the field. This is why I'm going to win Super Bowls when I buy the Jets. I'm agnostic. Remember, no I'm, emotion. I'm going in on you. I got it. You got a spot. I got for me. it. But you're talking like a founder. A lot of these people. You're right. You, right. You're you've right. Seen no, it? you're yeah, right. Because I've seen, never been a boss. I'm a founder. And, and you know this. You've seen it in your organization. Yes. You've seen it. I know it right now. There are people right now in my company that I know are suppressing the person underneath them because the person underneath them is more talented. I mean, you're right. So there's a lot of things, but in that scenario, that person that's being suppressed, even if they're right, even if they're 100% right, their boss is doing it, great, go get another job. Mm -hmm. You can do it. You can do it. When you actually realize everything's your fault, it gets really good out here because when you think your boss's boss controls your shit, When you think somebody down the street in a building controls your shit, then you get real sad because you feel helpless. When you realize you control your shit, things fucking go. It doesn't mean that every, like when I say everything's my fault, it doesn't mean that that's true. It means that it's just a happy place to think about. It feels empowering. You know, like when people get mad at me, they're like, Gary, what about, what about, I'm like, you're right. You know how many of those things happen to me? There's a million outside forces, but like, you know, it's really exciting to be able to think about like I could possibly do something about this while to your point earlier, still recognizing like whether it's grieving or being disappointed about yeah. it. You have to be able to do that, but it's just, you know, to me it's like what's the alternative? I think accountability is very important. Oh man, I'm a big you fan. Know? Everything on you, everything's your fault. You wanna really win in life? You wanna get real happy? You know why I'm really happy? Because I think everything's my fault. If I don't like it, I can change. Everything wrong at VaynerMedia, anything that ever happens, any piece of content, anything that ever happens in my life, 100 fucking percent is my fault. And let me tell you what happens with accountability. You get real happy. When you feel that there's no other source controlling your shit, all of a sudden it gets happier. If you complain, in the first hour I meet you, you're finished. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think complaining is the tell. Mm-hmm. And, and if you ask me right now what's going on with my content, there's a really interesting vibe going on because it must be the cadence of our content. I'm getting so much content from people that are happy out of depression right now mm. and I cannot tell you how many of them are completely predicated on the fact that they don't make excuses anymore and they've taken 100% accountability. I genuinely think it's the unlock of happiness. When you think it's all your fault, what you realize is that nobody's in control and all of a sudden you get happy. You're talking about who's dis- a person who's disproportionately benefited by the cool factor of entrepreneurship, but I don't want that. I appreciate it, like, as you can imagine, like, coming on stage and getting this kind of love from the 20-year-old set, it's like something I could have never dreamed of. It feels remarkable, but, but I'm unbelievably passionate about over-communicating the shortcomings of an environment where entrepreneurship is cool. 
it's, it's the same way that being a professional athlete and a rapper is cool. Very few people can actually achieve it at a heavy, high level of success. So two things are, past, are important to me. One, I wanna redefine what a successful entrepreneurship path looks like. Like, if you make $136,000 a year on a business that you run, that you like doing around something you like, and you can live that lifestyle, that is a remarkable feat. But that is not the picture we're painting of a successful entrepreneur. We're painting private jets and islands and all sorts of fucking ludicrous shit, you know? And so, A, I think it's remarkable. I mean, we, we need a level set. The, the 1% earners in our country, one of the richest countries in the world, the bottom of the 1% make $420,000 a year. Yet, like everybody starts the conversation of macro big success at a million bucks. Like we just, we, we're, we're twisted. And um, we also have to talk way more about happiness. We also have to talk about what it looks like to have a scarlet letter of an L when your company fails in a world where you've never had a public loss in your life because you've played through a school system. There's a lot of things that we have not addressed. There are a lot of people right now that are flossing on Instagram as entrepreneurs who are gonna go into deep depression or even suicide when they take a massive L on the next correction in our economy and that's going to be tough. Yeah, it's, uh, those are sort of pretty deep things to start with but yeah, if you, if you are... <laughs> You know, Gary dives right in. You know, if... You know, in, in talking about mindset and you're hitting, we have one of the leading researchers on purpose-based identity as opposed to achievement-based oh. identity where people tie their self-esteem and their, their life to how, you know, results and success. You know, spoiler alert, you're, you're not going to be happy. And so finding a purpose and aligning with your identity, that you're going to lead a much better life, you're going to be productive over a longer term, and you're probably not going to hit those low of lows that you talked about. I want to step back really quickly because you mentioned it, but I want to talk about a gear that you feel you have and why. And so for those of you who don't know your background, can you talk about your family, where you grew up, and how you grew up? I grew up really lucky in the fact that I had disproportionate adversity in the first decade of my life. You know, I was born in Belarus. We came to the US when I was three. I lived in a studio apartment with eight family members. Um, you know, it was super immigrant, right? We didn't speak English. Like, you know, we, my, my, my dad, I didn't even know my dad until I was 14 years old and started working in his liquor store because he woke up to go to work before I woke up and he got home after I fell asleep. I went on one family vacation in my entire life you know, or two, excuse me, two in my entire high school life, both to Disney World in Orlando, you know, stayed in the Holiday Inn, like, we kept it humble, we didn't buy dumb shit, you know, like, you know, I basically wore liquor t-shirts my whole life through high school, because they were free <laughs> from the liquor store. Like, the level of humility, and a lot of my ability to not worry about others was predicated on circumstance. Like, you know, and I, I, I really think that I'm the beneficiary of very good parenting and very lucky circumstances. And those lucky circumstances in my mind was I was never handed anything ever, ever. And I genuinely, when I hear stories in culture of people thinking people that are trust fund babies are lucky, I just don't see the world that way. I actually think they're disproportionately unlucky. It would be my great devastation to end up being my children or my grandchildren. I mean it. That's just the way I'm wired. It doesn't mean they're wrong or I'm right. It just means that for me, the way I turned out, the chemicals in my body, the thought of being handed something or starting with that kind of thing where my achievements would always be undermined because everybody would say that it was handed to me would be devastating. I grew up judging Bill Gates and Warren Buffett when I was younger of giving away their money because I grew up in an immigrant family where you like, you help each other and I judged them heavily and I was super wrong because I had no context. I was like, that's crazy, to a charity, like what? And now I understand, I want my kids to be happy and I do not believe that disproportionately paying for their lifestyle puts them in a position to be happy, I really don't, I do not believe that. On the flip side, kids, love to shit on their parents for doing that, but don't stop taking it. So, you're, you're gonna get lukewarm applause at USC for some of the kids here are like. <laughs> their, their parents are they're, they're here with real, the parents. It was a, it's, a, it's a really important point. I've been talking a lot about, look, I hate 
I hate when people shit on millennials because the people that are shitting on the millennials are the one who fucking raised them. <laughs> You're, they're shitting on the byproduct of what they've created. On the flip side, when I say that, the kids love that and they hit me up on DM, they're like, yeah, fuck my mom, she gave me too much. <laughs> like, I fucking hate, I hate it. And I'm like, and I reply and I'm like, cool dude, so give up unlimited Uber, asshole. <laughs> Get off the fucking payroll if you're so fucking unhappy. <laughs> but kids talk out of both sides of their mouth because they're hypocrites. Because they want to floss in front of their friends but what they don't realize is the quickest way to happiness is to stop taking the money. <laughs> it is. It's, uh, it, it, but it's a I'm, lesson, it's it a lesson that you, it's, hard to it's hard to learn as, as you're younger in that age, as you get older you it's see It's super it. easy to learn, you just have to realize that it's true and you have to start valuing the opinions of your friends. You have to start valuing it? Or stop. Stop, okay, yeah, that's what I thought you said. Uh, yeah, I was like, that goes against everything that I think we're teaching. But uh, can you, and so why do you feel with your upbringing and that that's an advantage, why did you sort of always feel you, you, you actually told my class, like I just feel you can't beat me, straight up. Why do you feel you have, <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. Yeah. Why, why do you feel you sort of have a gear? Because, is it because you really enjoy the process and I the work? I don't think anybody, look, I do not think anybody who goes to college and studies entrepreneurship can beat me in entrepreneurship. That doesn't mean it's right. It, and it's just kind of how my brain works. Like, I feel like it's a craft. Like, I, I, I don't think like, I, I think of it as a, we have not defied entrepreneurship properly. Here's why, again, I absolutely believe people that go to school for entrepreneurship can get better at entrepreneurship from that process. I desperately believe that entrepreneurship is a talent similar to see, singing and playing sports and I think that I'm on that spectrum and that gives me confidence in this one little narrow thing of entrepreneurship because while everybody else was studying in school and like playing sports and doing whatever they were interested in, I was constantly entrepreneuring. Right, and so I just have so much natural ability and so many years of practice that I feel like I'm on the extreme and that's why I'm confident about it. And so, yeah, I mean, chip on shoulder, right? No, and that's the only gear you've ever known if that's what you've been hustling since you're a kid. You always look at what does a kid do when he, when he or she's younger? Did she have a paper route? Did she hustle, you know, whatever it was. And you can tell when kids are on the right and, track. And Entrepreneurship is scary and you have to fight against the system and you have to see things others don't and you have to challenge norms and I quit school in third grade. You know, like, I did. Like, it's super weird, but like, I started getting D's and F's in fourth grade. I consciously walked into fourth grade and said, I'm out. <laughs> I did, I did. And it was mainly because for who knows why, and I, I, I really have no answer for this, but I just remember, I mean, fourth grade, you're a, ch I mean, you're a baby. It's a, it's a, it's, I'm looking at like other, four, like, <laughs> it's crazy to me that I actually had the thought process of, this isn't for me, I know who I am, I'm gonna be this, and I don't care about the periodic table. <laughs> Some people are. But we say, go find me a kid who really is in, in it to win it. And like, bring us that person, even if she doesn't have perfect scores. Or it's he doesn't... natural talent. Yeah. It's not even in it to win it. The, the SAT perfect kids are in it to win it. It's talent. Yeah. So that, if you... that matters. Like, I'm in it to win it to be a fucking pro football quarterback. I'm fucking in it to win it. It's not gonna happen. <laughs> And, and I, I, we do not have the proper context around entrepreneurship. We, until we start understanding the level of talent involved in it, we will always undermine how difficult it is because we think it's a process. And that doesn't mean, I, again, this is why underlining that, we have to contextualize how awesome it is. We have to start putting on a pedestal, starting a direct-to-consumer you know, jam business on Shopify where you make 183,000 a year because you love making jam because you and your grandma made it and like that being a massive success because you're happy as shit 
and you can live your lifestyle and you live under the means of 183,000 a year. We have to put that on a pedestal. That is when entrepreneurship can hit its golden era. This notion now of everybody building the next Instagram is ludicrous talk. You know, I'm in a good place, and I've always been. You know, somebody said to me, Dustin and I were talking about this on Radio Row, like I was talking about something and the kid jumped in, it was awesome. He was like, yeah, but you've got money. I was like, yeah, but you only are saying that because you're seeing me today. I would argue, in a lot of ways, all the stuff I believe in, I believed in even more and executed even more because now my time is being sucked into other things, mm -hmm. but I was, I was m not more happy in my 20s. And I, you know, I never made $100,000 in my 20s. It was just that I loved that I knew that I had more time. Time is my great passion. So in my 20s, I just knew like, man, I have another 80 years to do this. And that like brought me tremendous joy. As a matter of fact, the stuff that I spew online is just me talking to everyone about the conversations I have with myself. So when I'm out there saying, you're 30 or 40 and you have lots of time. Like, I literally think like this way. I'm 48. I'm like, okay, 48, modern medicine. Like, I should probably, God willing, nothing too crazy. I could get to 96. You know, I feel confident in that. And and I say to myself, crap, then I'm at halftime. Mm -hmm. You know, and I blew it the first 20 years of my career because I was a kid and didn't have the opportunity to go all the way. So, like, to me, that brings me joy. I actually am very concerned. This is real talk, very vulnerable. I am a hair concerned of what my psyche looks like in my late 70s, early 80s. I've, I've loved the idea of all this room to create and build. And I do get a hair concerned that if I know there isn't a lot more time, how will that fuck with me? My hope, and, I, and I've gotten a little bit more opt. I used to be very scared of this 10 years ago. Lately, now at, 30, at 48 versus 38, I'm like, okay, wait a minute. What's gonna happen is what I'm starting to feel. The more life you live, the, the more you're grateful for it, the more you've scratched certain itches. Mm -hmm. You know, even, it was so weird. Even walk, this is crazy actually. Even this morning, walking to my car from my hotel room to come here, I had this weird thought of like how excited I'm gonna be to be a grandfather. Like how I'm gonna like not want to go to like some big business thing because I'm gonna wanna go to my granddaughter's recital. So, you know, there's a part of me that's starting to get a little wiser about the concept of time. But boy, was like, I, I just have never seen money as the gateway to happiness. I've seen opportunity to build as the gateway to happiness. And I think that that drives me because I think no matter what financial or even emotional situation you're in, that optimism to you can turn it is very real. Because if you decide you can't, if someone's watching this and be like, fuck you, dude, like you don't know me. People have real shit. Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm just like, I'm like, listen, I get it. But if you just decide to say, it's never gonna happen for me, like it's over, fuck life, like, I got unlucky, it's no, well then it is. Mm -hmm. It just is. Yeah. What? How you see life is how it is. And so for me, no matter how shitty it is, my mom grew up, my mom was born in the worst country in the world at the time, the Soviet Union. You couldn't leave, it was North Korea. She lost her mother at five. Her dad goes to jail when she's 10 for 10 years. She has a shit life. She's the most optimistic, positive person I know. What do you think created that optimism in her? Her DNA and probably some, you know, they talk a lot about, and I'm undereducated on this, I don't know this to be true or not, but boy, do people have a big belief that those first three, four, five years of your life, there's a lot going on there. And knowing how my mom and what she did for me in those first five years, my intuition is that her mom did that before she passed mm -hmm. and might have just got in that optimistic, nurturing love and then DNA. Like sure. I have siblings, I have children. Like DNA is a real fucking thing. It is, you know, like it is what it is. And so I think, um, I don't know. I just, I sit here and I'm just literally, as I look at that camera, I'm like, man, if one person, if one fucking person who watches this video and millions will over the next decades, mm -hmm. as you and I execute, this will be more interesting for people to watch in 20 and 30 years is my intuition. Yeah. 
man, if one fucking person leaves this saying, you know what, fuck this. Yes, I had pessimistic parents. Even I have pessimistic DNA, but Gary's right, fuck it. I'm, I will go to therapy. And Like when people buy an $8,000 watch to make themselves feel better for a week, I'd rather them put that into a bunch of $250 therapy sessions over several years. Like I just wish people knew that you're not alive for a long period of time and you're dead forever. And so you have this tiny window. And you better- a lot of, Look, I was born in 1975. What year were you born? 83. Great. 75 and 83. A lot happened prior to 75 and 83. And a lot is gonna happen after we're gone. To me, it's like, fuck man, don't mail this in. Yeah. Cause you're mailed in before and after. Don't mail in life. Cause they're scared of judgment. Jeff, the difference between someone who goes and someone who doesn't is incredibly predicated on their self-esteem and insecurity framework. They don't want to go because it's easier to complain and tell everybody why everybody else got lucky because you're not doing anything. You think the thought, you're, what you're saying is the way others perceive me would control me that much that I would rather be in hell and unhappiness so I can be the victim and say it's because of this, this, and this, rather than have people judge my effort and be in the same position? Yes, because fear is one of the most powerful currencies in the world. Most of the way that parents will parent their children between now and forever will be predicated on fear. Most people work for people. When you and I, because of the way we're wired, we're like, why would you do that? Is because of fear. Fear is an incredibly, this is why Star Wars crushed it. The whole dark side and the Jedi's is very, 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 very well done. And I'll tell you why. I believe optimism and fear are very close. That's like why the world, and like, one? just like, they're just like this, like a, th- a thin line, mm-hmm. you know, just a thin line. And that's why the world wor- works the way it works. There's a lot of fucked up shit. And there's a lot of amazing shit. Mm-hmm. And I think that um, the dark side, like you look at Darth Vader, he's such an important part. This, I literally think about the world through the lens of Darth Vader. Like, is even though like the way that he like turns in the end of like, like it's just like, this is how I see the world. Like when I see 90 year olds apologize to their family for being not nice their whole time on their deathbed, it makes me think of Anakin. <laughs> and like, like it makes me think of him. And, uh, and that's how I see the world. And so, yes, I believe exactly what I just said. I think most people do most things because of outside validation. I I feel like so much that has worked for me comes back, when I was in my 30s and it started to get clear to me, I was like, that's why I was weird in high school. I was just like so utterly not penetratable with peer pressure. That's why I didn't drink. My mom asked me not to drink alcohol. I loved my mom so much that I wanted to do that for her. And even though pretty girls were like, come on, have a drink. And even though my buddies were like, you're a puss, like fucking drink. Like it just didn't fucking penetrate. You never had a drink in high school? No, no. And it never penetrated. And it just kind of like, I think like if you can deal with peer pressure in high school, I think you can deal deal with it for the rest of your life. You sure? I often say this is still all high school because it is for most people. (laughs) You know, and so even even this weekend in Vegas, what's going on with people? They're all peacocking. There was like people like upset they couldn't get into that table or that VIP room as if it matters. Mm-hmm. Like, you mean the subjective opinion of some people you barely know is that you're not as cool as them? Who gives a fuck? I obviously got to a place in my career where I'm lucky and can get into certain things, but there are plenty of times where I can't. Sure. And I'm fine. Who gives a shit? If Jay-Z doesn't want to invite me to something, that makes sense to me. That doesn't hurt my feelings, right? Like, and people just walk around with crazy insecurities and audacity. Like, I've, I've been to like events where I like see somebody roll up and they're like, they, like they're not known, they can't get into whatever this thing is. And they're like, yo, I got 80,000 followers on Instagram. And I just <laughs> watch that. And I'm like, by the way, please don't do that anymore. It doesn't make you look good. Not with winners. At least, like, what does that mean? Like, it's just so fucking high school. Who gives a shit how many followers you have? Who gives a shit if you have a blue check mark? Who gives a shit how much money you have? Really, it doesn't fucking matter. It's 
True. Like I don't really know how much money anybody really, really has. I know what people try to perceive out there, but it's not gonna make me like or dislike Drew Brees anymore, right? Like, I don't understand what we're doing out here. So yes, I yes, I believe that most people are scared of other people's opinions and it dictates all of their actions, all of that.